I'm used to restoring antique automata, but when I look at the reference books, there's usually a chapter on prosthetic limbs, arms and legs of great mechanical complexity. They've been made for hundreds of years, and the one we're looking at today was made in about 1910 by the Carnes Manufacturing Company in America. It's unusual because of its use of materials steel, aluminium, wood, wood fingertips for warmth of touch. Opening and closing the fingers, the first thing you might notice is it sounds just like cocking a gun or a rifle. The action is fast and very mechanical in sound. Let's have a look inside and see the mechanism. casting is very precisely made. The fits are excellent. It's similar to a clock or watch. The cord goes round a spiral cut steel disc. It's called the worm and it operates the tiny rack you can see moving up and down, the movement of which is amplified to make the fingers open and close. The thumb is spring-loaded actually spring-loaded in both directions to enable to grasp objects of different diameters. Now I'm going to try and remove the gantry that holds the worm so that we can take the cord out and replace the cord. It should be operated by a leather cord, 4mm leather cord, so this uh, textile one is not going to last very long if we leave it. The worm is held in place by six screws. A seventh screw holds a strong spring, which operates on the worm as a kind of brake. This prevents any backlash, any free play, allowing the fingers to not appear floppy. While I'm wriggling out the worm and its gantry, I should mention that there are examples of this hand in museum collections around the world the Smithsonian Museum, the Science Museum in London. And the reason for this is that this hand has great functionality, but a beautiful use of materials. The light aluminium for the main body of the hand. This lightness is so important. Hard wearing steel for the fingers. And then the fingertips made of hardwood for that warmth of touch beautiful combination. Once the worm is removed you can see that the cord is held secure in a diagonal hole clamped by a pointed grub screw. I removed the screw which thankfully hasn't corroded in place. It's a very small screw with a sharp pointed end that goes right into the leather cord. And now the cord should be free to pull out of the diagonal hole. The worm and the rack inside this mechanism are made of hardened steel. Great effort was made to ensure that the hand would be durable 
and not wear out. Here you can see the short sector rack. The turning of the spiral moves that rack up and down and you can just see the linkages to the fingers. There's four sets fitted on the transverse bar across the knuckles. And those levers extend through to each joint of the fingers to cause the fingers to extend open and close in a very natural way. Replacing the leather cord with a new one is quite straightforward. The cord is pulled through to its midpoint, allowing perhaps a metre of cord to extend either side of the worm. Once that grub screw goes in, that cord won't move again inside the worm. A single turn is taken in each direction around the worm and the whole unit is replaced back into the hand, threading the cords through so they extend out of the hole in the centre of the wrist. It's important to take care that the worm meshes correctly with the rack so that the fingers can extend fully and contract fully. The bar holding the spring for the backlash brake is a little tricky to replace because the, the spring pulls it out of alignment as you're screwing it in. But it's doable. Check the operation as the fingers need the full range of movement which shows the rack and worm were correctly aligned on install. Reset if necessary. As we think about reconnecting to the arm, we're going to look at one of the unique selling points of the Khan's hand. When bending the prosthetic arm at the elbow, the hand makes a 90 degree turn automatically. This Khan's promotional literature shows a man eating and the cup, the knife, the spoon is much easier to operate if it makes that turn, just as we do naturally without even thinking about it. The wrist of the prosthetic contains the mechanism for that turn. So you need to engage the turn, disengage the turn, and with the use of a clutch fitted all within the size of a large pocket watch, this mechanism is very intricate indeed. The forearm is made of wood, carved and hollowed out. The, wooden, the wood is stopped from splitting by being covered in rawhide that's steamed and shaped and applied like a lamina. It makes it very strong. At the wrist end a metal collar is fitted to ensure there be no splitting and to support the wrist mechanism. The hand is secured by four or five turns. Prosthetics has always been an area where innovation succeeds. In this 400 year old design by Ambrose Parr, you see a wonderful ratchet and click mechanism at the elbow in order to support the weight of the hand to assist the weight as the hand's lifted.
in our Khan's hand, the wrist mechanism is tightly integrated into the arm socket. In order to remove the mechanism for cleaning and oiling, I had to drill out a blind rivet at the elbow joint. The mechanism can be seen here with the sliding clutch removed for cleaning. The turn mechanism for the hand was initiated by an additional cord. Somehow this would have had to be pulled to bring about this movement. It was then turned off again and the hand returned to a fixed position by extending the arm suddenly. In later models produced from the 1930s, this wrist turn is not present. So I presume it was maybe slightly unreliable or found to be too expensive an addition to the whole arm. I have some documentation that shows that in 1931 the Khan's arm was available in all its forms for one price, $250. That's equivalent today to more than $5,000. So this would have been a very expensive item. One third cash on order, two thirds on delivery. The benefits of the Khan's arm well, that you could perhaps return back to work and again earning a living you could make the repayments necessary to pay for this expensive item of equipment. Khan's salesmen, no doubt working to commission, would scour the newspapers for small articles about people who'd had accidents, possibly with amputations. They would then receive a letter telling them the benefits of the Khan's arm and possibly the special payment plans that might enable them to afford it. Durable enough for the labourer, the arm was also delicate and precise enough for sewing and writing. This is a picture of the factory. And here's some of the documentation about the company. This brochure is from 1930 and includes the Mark II hand. And here's a picture of the factory. Note the modern motor carriage positioned outside the front, showing just how up to date this technology was. Some interesting facts to finish with. The Khan's hand was used as the model for the Hugo Automaton's hand in Martin Scorsese's movie, Hugo. Also, for the improved Station Master's prosthetic leg in the final scene, I used Ambrose Paré's spiral spring and ratchet mechanism, 400 years old. Hope you've enjoyed this film, and I hope you found it interesting as well. We usually have one on display under a glass dome attracts a lot of interest. If you're interested in owning one or you'd like more information, please get in touch. Thank you.